Okay, so today on the Plant Cunning Podcast, we have Freedom Cole. And so for those of you who aren't familiar with him, Freedom is a Vedic astrologer or a Jyotishika. And he has studied Ayurveda, studied uh, yoga, but is a real deal uh, astrologer, Vedic astrologer, initiated into a lineage that goes back at least 1500 years. Um, which not, if, you're, if you also aren't familiar, most Vedic astrologers in the West are not. Uh, so, uh, Freedom, how are you today? I'm great. I'm great. Looking forward to talking with you and your audience. Yeah, thanks for being here. It's exciting. So, Freedom, do you think you could <clears throat> say a little bit about uh, what you do and how you, oh, and what how I you do. got to be <laughs> what you are? <laughs> um, so... Uh, yeah, I, I originally started with a love of yoga mm-hmm. and, and mind expansion and consciousness and exploring the mind and uh, <clears throat> meditating and reading occult books about meditation and the energy body. And that got me deep into the yoga world. And uh, I, I, I met uh, a, a really incredible Indian teacher and began studying with him. And while studying with him, he taught Ayurveda because he was trained in Ayurveda. And the way he approached uh, yoga was integrated with uh, an Ayurvedic anatomy understanding. And then I went off and, and started studying Ayurveda because how could I do yoga properly if I didn't understand Ayurveda? And then when I was in Ayurveda school, there was it was just a one weekend module. And a lot of the beginner Ayurveda um, courses. And if they are certified with the National Ayurvedic Medical Association, it's actually required to have a, a introduction to Vedic astrology so that you know when to use it. Um, so it's literally National Ayurvedic Medical Association required to know about Vedic astrology. <clears throat> That's how integrated they are. And and when I when I when I learned about what you could see with Vedic astrology, I'm like, oh my gosh, Western doctors have X-rays and MRIs. This is what we have, and it's how could I practice Ayurveda without knowing this? So it went from yoga, how could I do yoga without knowing Ayurveda, to how could I know Ayurveda without this 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 astrology system? Yeah, <laughs> and I ended up after the program in India in an internship in uh, uh, Pune, uh, which is just outside of uh, Mumbai, which is formerly known as Bombay. And I'm studying there and I was going and I was meeting different teachers and I was really disappointed for an extensive time period because even um, in India, there's a lot of, just because they're Indian, it doesn't mean they have a long lineage of astrology behind them. There's a lot of people who they've just read a few books and then some Westerner comes along and, oh, I will teach you. It's, it's a, it's so um, it yeah. took time going through these various people. And I, I read everything that was available in English. And so I went to this one university that had a, a Vedic astrologer teaching there. And his methodology of teaching, it just, I could have banged my head against the wall. It just did not work. Um, It was like, come on, like, I know this, you don't have to say it again, like, I just said it to you, can't you get what I'm, you know, what he wasn't able to feel out where I was. So I spent a lot of time just going to these different astrologers. And, and at one point, I kept seeing this one uh, teacher being referenced. And all the Westerners that I was that were big names that I was respecting were starting to reference him as well. And so it was like, okay, let me meet this this teacher. And so um, I, I went and it just happened to be a Sunday that he was about to have a class. Mm-hmm. And I knocked on his door and uh, he thought I was there for a consult because people at that period of time could just knock on the door and get a consult. And I'm like, no, no, I want to learn. And he said, and he started asking me questions to kind of see where I was, which a lot of the other teachers alone didn't even do. And and I quickly realized that I was way below the uh, qualified for for what he was talking about. 
And um, he was about to send me away to one of his students when somebody knocked on the door and it was somebody who was coming for a consult. And so he sat down, he pulled up the stars in the sky at that moment. And he said, why is she here? And I looked and I stated and I was correct. And it was a condition about her, her kids. And, and he said, so what, what, what are the genders? How many kids and what are their gender? What, what, are their, what are their sex? And I said, two kids, I was correct. So it was like, all right, going here. And then he said, and, 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 when it, and then I said, uh, first is a boy, second is, is, is a uh, girl. And he said, no. and then he just started teaching. He's like, oh no, you see the second one, there's an, a mutual uh, exchange happening. Uh, uh, what do they call it in Western? Um, reception. Mutual reception happening. And, and that mutual reception alters what the, what the sex is. And so that 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 planet that's a female planet is showing up as it's two boys. And it was just like, so it and, and so and then he just finished the consult with her and then students started coming in. So I got lucky enough to kind wow. of just get, get in there for 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 class. And um wow. and one or two perfect of the timing. students perfect timing, right? Mm -hmm. And one or two of the teach students that were there. They, they said, okay, get this book, get this book, read this, read, okay. and, and they kind of helped me catch up so that I could be participating in Sunday classes. And, um, and so the years went on and uh, I studied in that tradition and practiced Ayurveda and I slowly became known much more for the astrology than for the Ayurveda. And it wasn't my intention. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, uh, the, yeah, it's just, it's, it's the way the, the universe unfolded and people kept coming to me for astrology, not Ayurveda. And, and because my heart is so around the Ayurveda, it, it was always there. It's always, I'm, I'm practicing. I'm, I'm occasionally there's the people that come just for Ayurveda. And then there's the people that come thinking they want astrology, but they actually need Ayurveda. So it's, <laughs> it's a very integrated, uh, practice from my side. Uh, those the the Ayurveda, the uh, Vedic astrology, and there's also when we go to the mental health side mm -hmm. of things, the yoga becomes very important mm -hmm. as well, because yeah, yoga has fine. direct techniques and practices to directly impact these mental states. And when you can integrate that with what you see in the chart, it, it allows for a very specific addressing of, of what's going on for that individual person. And so when you say yoga, do you just yeah. mean like Hatha yoga or do you mean like- uh, a Good, good, good statement. Because when we say yoga, a lot of people think, you know, the corner asana um, yeah. uh, place where they're just doing um, handstands and, and triangle poses and such, uh, where- that does have an impact. When I say yoga, I'm more referring to different type, different styles of meditation, what you're meditating on, where in the body you're meditating, um, different breathing techniques, whether we want to have an extended exhale or an extended inhale and, and how that alters the nervous system. Um, uh, yeah, so so I'm I'm much more on that level. And we also, uh, you know, in India, you would consider mantra part of yoga, mm -hmm. where in the West, it, people don't really associate mantra. They associate mantra with Hinduism, not as much yoga, but that's also a, a very, the tradition that I'm in is very heavy mantra focused. Mm -hmm. And while we're also defining terms right now, can you yeah. describe what Jyotish actually is and if it differs from Vedic astrology yeah, so so the 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 key word is is Jyotish. And uh, first, what does Jyotish actually mean in practice? And then there's how do we translate Jyotish into English? So those are two different elements. And when we look at Jyotish, um, uh, if if we look at modern Western astrology, uh, there's, so, and I won't even use the word modern. There's Renaissance astrology, there, there's Hellenistic astrology, there's, um, uh, Pluto evolutionary astrology. There's, there's so many different schools, yeah. Uranian, and, yeah. Uranian, and, and yeah. I, I don't even know all of them, but, uh, there's 
in India, there's as many, if not about a hundred times more different schools of astrology. And a lot of times we as, as Vedic astrologers, properly trained Vedic astrologers, will be able to hear somebody talk and know, oh, you're a Faladipika tradition. Oh, you're a Jaimini tradition. Oh, you're you're a Nadi Jyotish tradition. You're and and to know <clears throat> the difference between uh, Kerala astrology versus in East Indian Odia astrology versus and and so like this, you can get uh, quite a lot of variation within the uh, Indian realm. Now, when we translate Jyotish into English, uh, they the before the 1980s, the term used to be either Indian astrology or Hindu astrology. Um, th then it, there started to be this push towards using the word Vedic. And uh, some people argue which one is right. They're all wrong because they all have deficits. <laughs> um, the word yeah. Vedic, there's, there's Vedic culture and Vedic practice. And there's also tantrics who mm -hmm. would do Vedic, this Jyotish. So, and they were anti-Vedic. There was Buddhists who would do this, this Jyotish and they weren't, they are not considered Vedic. Uh, then if we use the word Hindu, we can see that there's Muslims in India who use the same system of astrology. There's Jains who use the same system. Yeah. There's, and, uh, uh, and Vedic culture, the other thing is when we call it Indian, it, you, and yes, it's most associated with what is presently called India, but what is presently called India is the British colony of the East Indian Company, uh, what land the British Empire controlled, right. which was actually made up of multiple kingdoms that are still very different cultures inside of India. But Burma, Sri, um, over to Sri Lanka, down into Bali, they all do, like if you look at their charts and, and the system of astrology they use, it's directly the same system. And Vedic culture used to go over into um, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Iraq, Iran. Uh, there's, you know, if we go back far enough all the way over to Turkey, there's um, clay tablets that are mentioning Vedic deities. So to say India, we're also not, and some people have said South Asian astrology, but then it doesn't bring in the whole connection with Iran, Iraq. It really differentiates. And a lot of people are like, oh, Indian versus Babylonian. It's in, in the ancient world, there was Vedic ritual happening in the Babylonian culture. There, it was it was there intermixed in that pagan reality. It wasn't like everybody in Babylon is just one religion. There was a mix of cultures and religions. And uh, so when we say Vedic or Hindu or Indian, they're all, they're just referring, they're, they're, they're best as we can to differentiate from other systems. But Jyotish is the word, and that means something Jyotish, like the of light. Uh, the word Jyoti means light. Okay. And, and the Ish, Isha at the end means that which is of. So it's that which is of the lights. And so we're looking at the luminaries, sun, moon, and the lights of the planets, and then the lights of the stars. Hmm. And we can bring all kinds of spiritual connotations to it as well, but it's literally talking about the luminous bodies. Hmm. Cool. Makes sense. So the study of, yeah. <laughs> so how does this relate to Ayurveda and why do you have to know it to really practice Ayurveda? Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, so uh, where to begin with that one, right? Um, there's, there's so, it's, it's such an interwoven element that we could approach it from, from multiple angles and directions. Uh, if, if we look at the scripture itself, um, Charaka Samhita, which is one of the oldest Ayurvedic texts, it's debated somewhere written between 300 BC, 300 AD, who, depending who you talk to, they'll argue something in that zone. Um, and it's a fully developed system that's extremely complex. So if it was that complex at that time, probably a thousand, three thousand years previous, it was being developed. Um, so if we look inside this text, it differentiates 
three levels of treatment. And the, the first is, is treatment of the physical body and, and addressing the, the physical reality and, and things. If you stepped on a nail, that, that's a physical reality treatment. Uh, we have no astrology in there whatsoever. Um, if you ate something that was not good to eat, that's we, we physical treatment. Um, then we have mental treatment which is the, the balancing of, of the mental realm and practices that are, are needed for that. And they're, in that level, we have both practices that are mental practices as well as herbal practices because we're, we're interacting. And then there is uh, what is called karmic practices, um, the karmic body. And we would sometimes into English, people will say mind, body, soul. And in India, even though a lot of people think that they all have the same religion, there's more religions in India than there probably is in the whole rest of the world. Uh, and, and they <laughs> love to philosoph philosophize yeah. about this. Mm -hmm. So some traditions believed you had a soul. Some traditions believed that the soul was temporary. Some mm -hmm. people believe that the soul was an eternal thing. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a million and one in between uh, different views. And so instead of saying soul, the word is karma. Mm -hmm. And, and yes, the soul might be that which carries the karma, but there's this karmic treatment that is, is required. And some people, uh, like I remember one of my first clients was a 19-year-old girl who had uterine cancer. Oh, wow. And you can't say that that's, she was eating the wrong food and, yeah. and the toxins built up. Now, somebody much older, they could have had a not good lifestyle that led to uterine cancer, but at 19 years old, right. that's karmic. Mm. Uh, a, a little, um, uh, a six or eight year old who has um, a, a blood cancer, that's karmic. So there's certain diseases that are just so clearly karmic mm. that th according to Ayurveda, why even to try and treat this with herbs, we're, we're, we're throwing, uh, it's like a spray bottle on a, on a huge house fire. It's, it's, yeah. you're going to yeah. burn your hand and, and make a lot of people unhappy because it's not going to do the job. Right. So, so Ayurveda is really clear that we have to differentiate the root of a disorder into its, is it physical? Is it mental or is it karmic? Mm -hmm. And now each of these levels are interacting with each other. Because there's certain karmas that are making certain deficiencies in the body. Why does, why if, if two people are eating the same food, one gets uh, a liver issue, the other gets a kidney issue mm -hmm. or, or something like this. And so yeah. we call it kavai gunya. This, there's certain deficiencies that are just, you could say genetically with you or, or that you were just born with these weaker areas. And so... Jyotish tells us where these weaker areas are, mm -hmm. these predispositions to have weakness. And then with the physical medicine, when um, you're a person is um, uh, eating too much spicy food in the summer and uh, being, you know, like this, it's that that's going to make them more angry, which mm -hmm. disturbs the mental realm. And mm -hmm depending on, is it mercury that's weak in the chart or is it um, uh, Jupiter that's weak in the chart? So will that go into the skin and become a skin inflammation or will it go into the kidney and become a, a, uh, um, a urinary uh, um, infection? You know, like which, which, where, where is the disturbance going to happen? So Ayurveda will tell us the, the a certain, um, what is creating the potential disorder, but where is that disorder going to manifest? The, the karmic level shows where that's going to be. And so there's this beautiful interaction between the two and the mind that's in between and how the mind either exacerbates the issue or can mitigate the issue just by the mental state and how we are handling these, mm. these, these two situations. Yeah. Um, I, I think that's a, that's a small reason of, of uh, and, and how did the question start? It started with, well, yeah. So how, how yeah. does it interact? How, how does it interact? So I think that's a, that's a good way, yeah. a good segue yes. into beginning with that interaction and certain disorders 
we don't even want to try to treat herbally. It's we got to start karmically. Mm -hmm. And and there's certain times like a person can't even figure out what's wrong with it. Yeah. You know, they go to different doctors and no one can figure out. At that point, we know we need karmic remedies. That, that's one of the indications. If nobody can figure out what's wrong, mm -hmm. karma. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's clear issue that we need to do some karmic remedies. And once those karmic remedies start to be done, all of a sudden, and the, the funny story that I tell with this is I had this atheist guy come and he didn't believe in astrology, mm -hmm. but his friends pushed him, said, hey, you should see freedom. And uh, he had spent like $100,000 on different doctors and tests and, and they put radiation stuff in them and MRI them and, you know, the whole, he woke up every day sick. And, and couldn't, no one could figure out what was wrong with him. And he was okay by the end of the day. And then he was sick the next day. Hmm. And so I told him, do this mantra, have the priest do this puja. And he's like, I don't believe in any of that. And I said, you don't got to believe, just do it. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and he did, he, he, he just did it. He didn't, he didn't. And, and, and the thing is, it's not about faith. In, in the Vedic perspective. If you work with the right deity, the deity does what the deity is supposed to do. And um, two months later, he writes me and it's, and, and I, I say this one, cause it's like, you can only laugh. He said, your remedies didn't work. I found I found a doctor that figured out what was wrong with me. Seven <laughs> years. It was seven years he couldn't figure out what was wrong with him. Two months into do it after the puja and, and, yeah. and the mantra. And you know, <laughs> He finds it. And, and so uh, that, that karmic blockage to getting the right medicine is very, very common. Mm. Right. Um, oh, that is funny. Uh, yeah. It didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't work. It, no, it didn't work. It, the doctor figured out what was wrong. <laughs> As if, you know, yeah, the, the misunderstanding um, that some of these rituals will just magically make everything go away versus removing the karma that is creating the issue so that you can get the right medicine, so that you can get the right diagnosis, or yeah. that you can start eating the right foods and, mm -hmm. or, or you just find out, oh, I've been allergic to this for my whole life. And that's why I've been having this problem. And, and you know, like, it's not like it just magically makes everything perfect, but to find out that that one food was an allergen, oh my gosh, what a oh, drastic my. change to a person's life. Absolutely, yeah. 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 That's a lot of the chronic diseases is just <laughs> eating an allergen every day, <laughs> a little bit, <laughs> exactly. and then not knowing what it is. Mm -hmm. And then you can do a, you know, elimination diet and it's still, <laughs> uh, so you can, you can find these by looking at the birth chart or are you looking at transits? Like how, how do you actually determine it is like the, and yeah, in Western medical astrology, yeah. like we have the zodiacal man and we have like each zodiac sign is, is, is corresponds to a body part. And then the, each of the planets corresponds to a body part or organ. But how does that work in, in Jyotish? So th there's one other level. So each sign correlates to a body part. Each house corresponds to a body part uh -huh. and each planet corresponds and and this is where we start running into issues between modern medicine and ancient medicine. When we oh, start, yeah. go to the planet, they, they're not ruling body parts. They're more ruling body functions. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, blood is, is a function. Mm -hmm. right. It's a different way of looking at the human being is not that this is just some thing I can take out and add new in, like your body is producing blood. There's a system that blood is produced. There's a system that blood nourishes and there's a system that blood takes back into itself. And, and so when we say blood from an Ayurvedic perspective, it has a very different concept of, of what that does and how that is in the body. Um, for example, uh, Jupiter is related to fat. Mm -hmm. And if we just think about fat as, oh, that thing that's on my belly that's too much or on the thighs that's too much, then we're in this Western model. Uh, and, and we won't understand what is the relationship between Jupiter and, and the kidney function. Mm -hmm. Because the, the fat system, it's, it's and, and I can't go too into that, but that what we call fat system 
and the kidney function are, are related from an Ayurvedic perspective. So right. when we go into the planets, we're, we're working with what's called datus, which are, are these uh, body system functions. And those body system functions are now going to different body parts and areas and having dysfunctions or, or not. And what would show up as a kidney in one house is showing up as skin in another house is showing up as um, a brain issue in another house is showing up as ADDD, ADHD in, in another uh, condition. So, uh, so we're, we're using houses, signs, and planets and their interaction. And this will generally show us Kavaigunya. Kavaigunya means what are the deficient systems? Mm -hmm. Where is there a tendency for there to be an issue? When things go out of balance, where will that out of balance be? Now, transits are more the balance and imbalance happening. And so, and just as the, the easy example that I give is Saturn transiting through the ascendant. Mm -hmm. When Saturn transits through the ascendant, it makes the air element increase which in Ayurveda we call vata. Mm. And so vata becomes excess in the system. Now, all it's doing is, is making the vata become excess, but it's what's happening in the natal chart that's going to show where that vata, where that excess air is gonna create a deficiency. Okay. Is it gonna make anxiety? Is it gonna make digestion an issue? Is it gonna cause rheumatoid arthritis? All of that can happen with Saturn transiting through the ascendant. But if we can directly address Vata with that Saturn transit, which an Ayurvedic practitioner knows how to do, then we can prevent all the other issues from arising wherever they are in the chart. Yeah. And so that's why the Ayurvedic practitioner needs to know astrology to know when what the root cause is, like when... Saturn is, is moving. Through so, and I know people who do Vedic astrology without properly knowing Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. And, 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 you know, I, I just, I just put my hands on my head and say, I, I can't save the whole world. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but with, with my students, we, we do a, uh, in my second year course, we do an introduction to Ayurveda and make sure that they know the general components Mm -hmm. uh, not that they can directly treat it, but at least put them into the right thinking process. And uh, a lot of them go off to learn more Ayurveda. And uh, because of my mixing of these two realms at the level that they're integrated, I'd say that 50% of my students are coming from the Ayurvedic world to me to be able to get the uh, Vedic astrology side of Ayurveda. So I have a, a part that are already fully trained in Ayurveda. And then I have the part that I have to make sure they're introduced and I have to do it in this way that doesn't bore the, the, the half of my students <laughs> that already know Ayurveda to a much higher level. Yeah. And doesn't overwhelm the students that, that don't know. And so it's this little okay. realm of uh, uh, mix there. Uh, yeah. One of my bigger dreams in the future is to make an Ayurvedic course that wow. is geared particularly for astrologers. Yeah, And it's one of those ones that gets keep a one year out, one more year out, one more year out, but it, yeah. it'll be there eventually. I have three children right now. So <laughs> well, that's a, yeah, they, they, they wow. keep me busy. And you're just finished the first year of your five-year program. Yes. So maybe after that. We're halfway through the first year of the five-year course. Oh, halfway. Okay. Yes, yes. <laughs> just counting though. <laughs> so, so how do you see if it's a karmic issue uh, in the chart? Ah, so in, in the chart, everything is karmic. Right. <laughs> okay. So, so when, when we, and, and uh, and that's one of the, the key elements of, uh, there's this Western concept that Rahu and Ketu, that, mm -hmm. that's North and South Node are karmic control planets. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of a funny thing from the Vedic perspective, because that's what planets are. Right. Planets are karmic controllers. They're mm -hmm. karmic <laughs> indicators, whether you call them indicators or controllers, or they, they are the, just like if we did an x-ray and saw your bones, 
if we look at the chart, it's like an x-ray of your karma. It's the, and, and if you did an x-ray, I could see what your bone structure is. It doesn't mean I exactly know what you look like, but I know what the potentials of you to look like are. I know whether you're going to be a wider or a thinner person. I know the, the general tone of what you'll look like. And the little details are going to vary and the skin might vary from an x-ray. And similarly, when we look at a chart, it's like the x-ray of karma. And we have all kinds of other layers that can go on that and shift and change. But there's a certain fundamental foundation of, of what is, is holding up who you are. And um, so when I look at a chart, it's, it's all karma. When from the Ayurvedic perspective, that's a little bit more where it becomes uh, work to say, is this karma or is this something that I can treat without needing to address karma? Yeah. When we get, when we get the person who's lived this super healthy life, they bike all the time um, or, or run or jog, they exercise and eat well, and then they get cancer. We, we know that we can't blame it on, on bad lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when, when it's non, the, the factors of life do not inherently indicate the disease that has arisen, then we know that there's most likely karmic indications that are there. And so then would you look for like the planet that's in the worst position in the chart and do remediation for that planet or. Yeah. How do you treat like, karmic yeah, how issues? Do you, how do you know? know yeah. where um, yeah. So now how to see it, that is, and, and notice I said, I teach the medical astrology to my second year students. Right. Okay. <laughs> they, they do a whole year first and then another half a year before we even get into the medical astrology, just yeah. because of the, so um, complicated. the, the complication of, yeah. of really being able to understand how planets are interacting. Yeah. Uh, to, to, to do it in a surface level would not fully do it justice. Occasionally, it's there's something that's just, it's so obvious. And yeah. other times, um, like, why did this disease happen before that disease? And that you need a, a, a good training in how the, the planets are interacting and how timing is interacting and how transits are interacting to fully be able to say when. Um, but how do we treat the karma? That's, that's a place that we have the ability to touch, you know, really yeah. touch upon. Oh. And um, in the Ayurvedic texts where they define the physical medicine, mental medicine, and uh, uh, the term they use is, is karmic medicine. And, and we can dig into this word karmic medicine a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. Well, yeah, I guess it might be good to define karma too, because like from yes. my perspective as somebody who has not studied uh, the Vedas or any, I see karma as like the, all of your past actions, it's like the, the force of habit. Um, but when you're, from what I'm getting from what you're saying from karma, it's not just that, you know, this person has had the force of habit through its entire life of biking and eating well, but there's something from a previous life that is interrupting that karma? A little of both. So okay. force of habit, we could also call Kriya Mana karma. Okay. And so when we go into karma theory, which is the realm of Vedic astrology, okay. to, to really study karma and the different levels of karma and densities of karma. Mm -hmm. uh, we have, uh, if we first break down into four groups and then there's, there's four groups, three intensities. And so of the four groups, we have, all the karma that you ever created in the world, all lives, even when you were an animal and, and all the different uh, forms and incarnations. And uh, that is a, a certain bank of, of karmas. Then we have the karmas that were chosen to be experienced in this lifetime. Mm. And those that were chosen to be experienced in the lifetime show up in the natal chart. Okay, That's what's in the chart at the moment you were born. And, and what's in the chart, the, that's, it's not everything there, but that's what you have chosen to take on and address in this life. And 
then we have kriya mana karma, which means, okay, I did a ritual, I did a, I did, um, I, I did a prayer, I did a remediation, I, I went and worked in a homeless shelter for a, lot, a while and helped uh, helped people. This has to alter your karma, or you did you stole something from somebody, or you you did something negative, and this is altering the karma. Mm -hmm. And so that kriya mana karma, that's what we see in a horary chart. Ah. Right. So when we do a horary chart, we're looking at what is the karma that you've created since you were born. Yeah. And what also what impacts this specific moment or this specific event that you're asking about. So, so at the moment of time that I, if, if you randomly three months from now said, hey, I, I, I'm having this uh, issue happening here. And uh, I looked at the moment that you wrote me, that yeah. moment that you wrote me should be indicating what kind of issues you were doing in this life that brought that about. Right. And normally when we look at the, the, the horary question and the natal chart, you can see some overlap. Mm -hmm. Like, for example, um, let's say somebody has a um, Mars in the sixth house. And that's causing some problems. It's going to eventually cause problems. And you just happen to ask me a question at the moment that Mars is in the sixth house in the same sign as when you were born. I know that, okay, that Mars is getting activated now and, and the karma from that. And you must have, and, and Mars in the sixth house means that there's been a fight. Hmm. Uh, you know, that Mars in the sixth house is somebody who argues and debates a lot. So uh, who did you get into a fight with who's really uh, upset with you? And now that's <laughs> causing this uh, heatedness that you're resentful and not letting go of and something of that nature. So so that's that that's Kriya Mana Karma, the karma you've you've created in this life. Okay. And then we have Agama Karma. And Agama Karma is the karma that you're creating that you're going to experience either in in the future years or maybe the next life. So we have these four types of karma, the all and en all encompassing karma, the karma that you you've chosen to, I have to experience in this life, then the karma that you're creating in this life, then the karma that you're creating for the future. Mm -hmm. So Kriya Mana is, is you've created it in this life and you're experiencing the results now. Mm -hmm. Agama, you, you've, you've done some stuff and you're going to be experiencing that. Okay. But it's not in the birth chart itself. Mm -hmm. And so, so we have those four types, then we have three intensities. And there's karma that uh, it's, it's a small little thing. We can say a small prayer and the karma will, will be removed or we, we break the bad habit and, and the karma will be shifted. Then there's also the, then there's the other side of that spectrum is fixed karma. Karma that no matter what you do, you can't change. And then there's this uh, mixed karma that's kind of in between. And so when we look at a chart for a health condition, we judge what density of karma is this. And sometimes if it's fixed karma, you know, it's, we, we just have to experience it. Right. And if it's simple karma, most of the time, the, the simple karma, you don't even need a, a Vedic remedy for the herbalist alone can address okay this is coming up let's an herb is enough to shift that karma um and then it's it's that more middle realm that the remedial measures can come in and so uh yeah what are some of those karmic yeah. remedies so, so, like? so as we jump before the karmic remedies the, the yeah. term they use mm -hmm. in the ayurvedic texts is called daiva and daiva can it, it can mean fate mm -hmm. or and and they they say they call it daiva and then in other places they call the disease karma ja ja meaning born from karma so it's a karma ja roga a disease born from karma and for the karma ja roga you need daiva chikitsa you need treatment of fate mm -hmm. treatment of this karma and so when they list physical medicine, mental medicine, daiva medicine, daiva chikitsa, the medicine treating this fate level, uh, the, uh, it's, the, the first statement they say is, is chanting of mantras. The next they say is, is medicines. So we have herbal medicine has the ability to be altering karma if worked in the right way. Um, wearing of gemstones, uh, making offerings, um, 
uh, and uh, uh, oblations, offering rituals to a fire, mm -hmm. um, uh, gifts, meaning donation. And I, I put a lot of, particularly for um, Western clients, I put a lot of emphasis on donation because it's a very easy way for most Western people to begin working with karma. And everybody wants to donate to, there's so many things that we can donate to. Imagine if we just know, okay, if I donate to this, I won't get Alzheimer's in 20 years <laughs> yeah. from now. If I donate to this, I won't get prostate cancer when I'm older. Oh, if I donate to, and so, um, so the donation is a really powerful remedy. Um, then there's, uh, uh, we call it prayas chitta, which means um, atonement, ways that we can um, uh, fast, that we can do to overcome certain karmas. And I recently was writing a bit about, uh, I was researching into some prayas chitta, some of these atonements, because uh, in, in America, there was recently the reversal of Roe versus Wade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so this whole abortion issue has, has arisen. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you search online about Vedic culture and abortion, all you will find is the anti-abortionist argument. Hmm. And, and it's really interesting. I'm like, why is this so loud? The Ayurvedic texts are filled with um, different herbal treatments for abortions. Mm -hmm. And so it was a common practice. And in the texts, it's literally, it's, it's considered a, a minor sin, meaning like if you steal something, that's a minor sin. It's not like you killed some, it's not like you killed somebody or, or this, or you, it, it's this minor sin and there's an atonement to do for it. Mm. You know, a certain amount of fasting and some prayers and some offerings. And then that, you know, removes whatever um, issue uh, karmically was there for this. And so I was recently, and so that's a type of atonement. Like, how long do you fast? What's the mantra that you do while you're fasting? And what kind of donation can you do to, to, to balance out any karma that was left over from that? And anybody that's listening and, and wants to know about that, just search my name and, and the word abortion. And you should probably, the article should prop up online. Um, so we got atonements, um, hymns, um, and then there's yatra, visiting holy places, pilgrimages. Mm. And now where the Ayurvedic texts, they just list all of them together. When we get into the Vedic astrology realm, we get very particular of uh, like, for example, if the problem planet is in the ninth house, mm -hmm. pilgrimages are the primary remedy. Mm. Mm -hmm. if, if it's Venus, then going on a pilgrimage to a place where a Venetian deity is being worshipped mm -hmm. or where that Venus energy is fully honored in a sacred way is a karmic remedy. Cool. And um, uh, where, um, yeah, so, so like this, there's ways to look at the house and be very specific with these remedies. Right. That's, that's seems really helpful because there, you know, that's a lot of different remedies so and it, it's important to know uh which, which one is, to do and also it's going to be effective yeah. yeah because so i'm familiar somewhat with the donation christopher warnock one of my teachers he has popularized in the west the uh the planetary charity which i'm sure he took from the yep. um and for for that you know you're supposed to donate at a particular time like the planetary hour and the planetary day using a, a, the number of the planet is that is that the same is that the traditional way to do it or is it is it different <sighs> So there's a few different traditions. As okay. I mentioned in India, there's, yeah. <laughs> if you go to different places, there's, ver there's a variety of different traditions. And then there's what I've modernized to the modern world. Hmm. And both in, in how we do donation and in when we do the donation. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a big fan of like, for example, there is a remedy for planting trees. Hmm. Now, if you go out in your yard and plant two trees, how much change in the world did that create? And if you go to an organization like Arbor Day and you give $50 to them every month, the amount of trees that they can plant with that and the impact that that's going to have if you give $50 a month in, in 20 years from now, the amount of trees that you planted is just, is just awesome. And, and yeah. so- uh, to me, I really look at what's the impact 
our uh-huh. donation is going to make, not just the fact that we've made the donation. Mm. Uh-huh. And so that's that's one of the first key elements. And and being that I've been doing this practice for more than 20 years, I, I see people with this disorder or that disorder, and I give them donations and and it either works or it doesn't work. Mm-hmm. And, and we, we sometimes we change this or change that way and then bah, it works. Mm-hmm. And when you actually give a really good donation recommendation, like it's properly fine-tuned to the chart, you'll sit there and you'll say, um, uh, let's give a donation for mental health services for older women. You know, if you can get that fine-tuned and the person will be like, my grandmother suffered uh, terrible depression and schizophrenia her whole life. It's that we can see this correlation. Or if you sit there and say, uh, let's give a donation to uh, veterans, um, something, something. And the person is like, my father was a veteran. And it's like, like if you give the right donation, it's 90% of the time, the person will, it it already is aligning with their life in some way. Cool. Yeah, that's really cool. Because you can see it in the chart, like, you know, Mars is in a specific place or Venus is in a specific place. It has a particular energy to it. And our goal is to feed that energy. Mm -hmm. Now, if planets are in the 11th or second house, donation is required. Oh. Mm. And it means that in the past life, you've done something wrong with finances. Mm. Taken some finances and misappropriated them. So you have to give money. Those, Those require money. Mantras and pilgrimages won't touch the money okay. that you took and, and, and used in the wrong way, right? Wow. Right. So, and in the other areas, donation is, is it's, it's really wonderful. Um, as far as timing, uh, I'm a big fan in the modern world of, I, I love these organizations that you can sign up and they just take a little bit of money mm-hmm. each month out of your account. Because really, if you have cancer, to give a hundred dollars to something and think that it's going to get rid of your cancer is not, it's, it's not, it's, it's just not going to remove your cancer a hundred bucks. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, it's on the same level intensity. It's not on the same level, yeah. but if you sign up to something to donate a hundred bucks a month and you've committed to sign up to that, I tell people it's like when you buy a house, you don't have to have 500,000 up front. You just have to have a little deposit and then you have to commit to pay each month the mortgage down and eventually you'll own the house. Mm-hmm. And karma is very similar in that way. You just sign up for these and, and let it go for, for a decade or two and it's it slowly is, is taking care of the karma. And the planets know, hey, they've committed to, to help this part of society and it, it balances. It's like the karma almost holds off as it slowly gets digested through the donation remedy. Wow. Um, and so when we're signing up like that, it's it's the sign up moment that oh. matters. Okay. Right. Right. Because that's the start of, of the donation. Right. right. Not and when they so, take it out of the account. Yeah, it, it, exactly. Not when they take it out. You, it's when you start it. And so the day of the planet is really nice. Um, the planet hour is okay. I like to use, if we can, and sometimes we just, we want the person to start donating right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's get going. We, it's, uh, um, but uh, if we, we like the uh, rising sign to be the exaltation sign of the planet that you're donating to. Right. But so, so cancer rising on a Thursday. And, and that's the exaltation, this upliftment moment of, of Jupiter. So this is, this is what I like to do. You can also do planetary hour. Planetary hour is really, because hours is 60 minute portion. Mm-hmm. We also have kalas that are 90 minute portions. We have gatikas that are 24 minute portions. And, and we, uh, the wow. planetary hours are great for when you want to invoke the planet to you. Okay. Yeah. Like if you're doing a petition or right. invoking it into material, then the planetary hour is really important. Right. If you're trying to clear the planet's energy, we have these kalas, these 90 minute windows, and the planetary kala is really better for clearing the planet's energy. Hmm. 
And so we have all these different timings and whether morning, noon, or sunset, um, but for, for the donation, if we can get the exaltation sign of the planet rising on the day of that planet, it's, it's, it's like we're calling forth, please rise up. Wow. That's, that's really beautiful too. Yeah. You know? And you're not worrying about like the state of that rising sign. You're not, well, if there's like a, if it, like Mars or Saturn is in cancer at the moment. So the thing is that you're not with, with donation because we're not trying to invoke the planet's energy and right. forever holding that moment's energy in, in an item. Like they've right. done an astrological yeah. magic. Yeah. Instead, we are, we are asked, we, we're giving to the planet. Yeah. And saying, I'm giving to you for, this is the reason I'm giving to you. Mm. And so if it's exalted and we're saying, hey, I want to exalt you, it's, hey, I want to exalt you. You're not, you're not holding the energy of that moment in you. You're, wow. you're, you've just only stated the reason that you're giving this this donation so we don't need to have a um a completely clear like we, with with the talisman you need a certain perfection of energy because you're holding that energy with you mm -hmm. yeah. we're not holding the energy of the donation it's it's the this is this is what we've begun this is our it, and it's almost like that that starting moment is showing your intention mm -hmm. mm. That's yeah, that's really amazing. <laughs> and so you would, um, at the time that you're giving the donation, would you, you, you say you hold the intention, are you going to say a mantra? Or are you going to have like a little ceremony around really, it? Really stating the, the intention is key. That's the most important part. I, I let people do that in the way that they, uh, best works for them in India, you get a priest and he says some prayers and sprinkles some water and does a few okay. things of that nature. Uh, it's, it's not going to happen in the West okay. now. But talking about timing, I have, I, I, I give this the lecture about donation to Ayurvedic practitioners mm -hmm. who will never, who their client will never go to an astrologer. Mm -hmm. You know, they have that client who's just like astrology, right. like it's already weird for them to be doing herbal medicine. Yeah. Let them <laughs> now go to somebody who's going to recommend gems, mantras, and, and, <laughs> and so um, yet donation is, like somehow people are pretty open to, hey, you know, there might be some karmic blockage. Like karma, people don't associate with astrology. So they, so they, th there's this openness to it. And, and to just recommend a donation um, for whatever karmic blockage. So for example, if they're dealing with um, a female reproductive stuff, doing a donation to a women's shelter mm -hmm. or a, uh, a place that helps um, women uh, who are suffering from violence and and just it might not be the perfect donation and they might not be the perfect time but it's better to get them donating to that while they're getting this treatment for for their whatever cancer or menstrual problem than to not have it at all so we want to just I, I make I, I aim it's better we do something than nothing right. it's like a gateway into the world and I think maybe that comes from like the mostly Christian or Catholic upbringing of like, okay, you can kind of like throw money at the problem. You can and... throw money at the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and they're like, oh, I understand how to do that. I'm in a capitalist country and was raised Christian. Got it. No problem. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Like buying a, uh, what did they buy in, in the Catholics? A indulgence. <laughs> mm -hmm. they, would, they would do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. there's, there, this is just one of the things. I mean, the gem, gem re remediations yeah. are a big thing. And then the medicines themselves, uh, are those done? Like, I guess we could open up the, the, the worm can of worms of correspondences yeah. and like, so are, are you using herbs that have planetary correspondences or is there something else going on? Like, and so I, everybody who studies astrology, they all want the planetary correspondence to get rid of disease. Mm -hmm. It's, it's kind of this, okay, what this, I can use this herb and it'll get rid of Saturn or I can use this herb and it'll get rid of Mars. And, and, uh, and I, I'm going to say yes and no. And, and because yes, you can. And no, it's not the ideal way to practice. So, so just, to, just to, at least in my own practice. Mm -hmm. And when we say herb for planet, we're talking astrological magic. 
Okay. We're not talking herbalism anymore. And, and that's my my personal opinion. I don't know what other people hold, but um, and and to to really give give form to that, uh, if, if and, and just to differentiate, uh, there is, for example, for Saturn, uh, there is an herb called ashwagandha. Yeah, we love ashwagandha. Ashwagandha. And so the root of ashwagandha, um, you can do certain prayers and tie it to the right arm, and that is a protective talisman from Saturn. Mm -hmm. um, there's Calamus. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You take the root of Calamus, do some Dorga Puja with it, and tie it to the, to the right arm. And it's a protection from Rahu, the North Node. Uh, uh, turmeric, the turmeric root, is one of the best protections from Mars. Hmm. Okay. Um, but that is, notice that we're, we're tying it to the arm. Yeah, so it's magical. It's not. It's magical. We we you you have to make sure that the timing is done right, that the prayers have been done properly, that it's that the um, spirit has been invoked in a way that will the spirit of that plant is protecting you. Mm -hmm, right, mm -hmm. right. And and so when we do di this direct correlation, we are in this realm of of magic, and so all the other elements of magic need to be correctly applied in order for effectiveness. Yeah. Okay. Just if, if a person just ties the, the ashwagandha to their arm, it's just a piece of ashwagandha tied to their arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and uh, now if, if, and, and so that's from the magic, uh, that's, that's the yes. And then when I go to the no, um, <clears throat> You know, and as I said, yes and no. And from the no, the way I'll, I'll, I, I work is, you know, when that Saturn is going through the ascendant and the Vata has, has increased, I know that Vata has increased. Now I go to that person and, and sometimes, like particularly for my older clients, uh, the Saturn going through the ascendant and Vata increasing when somebody's in their teens, they don't even notice it. When they're in their 20s, it's uncomfortable, but like it goes by. 30s, 40s, they feel it. it it's, it's uncomfortable, but it won't create any major disease. Once people are over 50, that Saturn transit is going to be whatever is breaking down in the body and weak, it's going to be exacerbating. And, and, and it's, it's like it's that bump that makes the weak tire go flat. Hmm. That, that Saturn transit. And so that Saturn's there. I'm not just telling everybody to wear ashwagandha with certain prayers and such. Mm -hmm. I'm looking at what's the what's the condition in their chart that's that vata is going to, to complicate. And then I'm, I'm recommending herbs that are going to support that system. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to be recommending um, certain lifestyle practices, what kinds of foods they'll be eating that are vata reducing. I might, depending on what's, I might send them for massages. I might send them for enemas. Ayurveda uses enemas a lot. Um, and we use a lot of herbal enemas. Um, I might uh, get them on a certain um, uh, like uh, certain herbs that are rejuvenative, if that's the, con so, so it's really going to depend and I'm going to make sure that I'm fitting my herbal protocol to them based on knowing that the vata is going up and what's going to break when that vata goes up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and to me, that ensures um, I'm not going to, to have an issue. Right. I'm, I'm going to get, get we're going to get over that bump. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's it's also just uh, like, for example, um, anybody who is uh, sidereal Capricorn rising right now, Aries is the fourth house. And we have the North Node transiting there with Saturn aspecting. Mm -hmm. And so that fourth house is is getting really uh, Vata disturbed. And with the North Node there, there's unhealthy cellular growth. Now, mm -hmm. if the person has a weak fourth house, a malefic in the fourth house, or the moon is having an issue, that those are three factors that can set them up for breast cancer. Wow. Right. Wow. And, and at that point, <laughs> at that point, I want them to uh, make sure they're getting mammograms. And maybe if they only do it every two years, let's do it twice a year for, for this transit. Mm. Because at that point, getting the... Um, 
the sooner they find out the better. Right. Yeah. So how do you break news to someone like that? Where if you're seeing like, oh, you you're a likely candidate for breast cancer. How do you do that? Like, what's your bedside manner, for lack of a better word, regarding breaking that? Most of the people that come to me as clients Mm -hmm. know what I do. Right. And and 90 percent of them have in their health. They want to know about their health. Okay. And so it's they've already asked. Awesome. Um, And, and a lot of times people will say, what do I need to worry about this year? Or what do I, my, my clients that come to me regularly. Yeah. And, and so um, it's, it's, it's already something to, to bring up. And, and what I like to do in general yeah. uh, for, for my yearly clients is I always tell them what's the health stuff we need to focus on this year. Mm. So I, so they know that they're going to get some health protocol suggestions or let's, let's do these herbs this year. Let's do, uh, or let's do these herbs until July or let, you know, something of, of that nature. So they're, they're expecting Mm -hmm. um, this from me. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's just right up front and you're offering solutions. You're not just like, good luck. (laughs) I'm not saying, oh, you're going to get cancer. I'm I'm sitting here and, and I make sure to say there's a possibility Th- mm-hmm. This is what is the area to worry about this year. Cool. And we don't need to worry about colon cancer this year. We don't need to worry about brain cancer this year. We don't need to worry. <laughs> the, the breasts are what we need to worry about, or the heart is what we need to worry about. And 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 uh, this is what we should do to, um, you know, make sure you're, and, and I give them, I, I make sure that I'm, I'm not practicing out of scope from a Western perspective. I'm yeah. like, make sure you're getting, uh, do two mammograms this year instead of one. Uh, and because mammograms, you know, a lot of people worry, at, well, the radiation from that might cause breast cancer. And, right. and so some people are going less, less frequently than they should. Right. So go less frequently than you should. And for this transit, we want to go more often. Right. Uh-huh. It's very simple. <laughs> and what can we do? What kind of oils can we use to, to massage the breasts? Mm-hmm. What kind of herbs can we take and cleansing protocols and and uh, whatever that weak planet was that is saying that that would be the thing to worry about? There's always a emotional component that is connected with that. And so I'll bring up, hey, you know, is, do you happen to have some resentment towards your brother? And and I'm like, this is the time period to work that out because this can actually cause, um, this is, this is connected to this potential breast cancer um, transit. So if we can work this out, do these herbs and, and make sure we visit a doctor, we, we should be able to get through this with no problem. So cool. It's just incredible how many details and how holistic this approach is. It's amazing. And and that's the beauty with the yoga, the Ayurveda and the Vedic astrology together is get this, this beautiful integration. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. It's, it's so hard in, you know, in America where there's like, (laughs) all of our traditions are in pieces Mm -hmm. for the most part there is no direct lineage Mm -hmm. Uh, there's no holistic all of you know that's all been suppressed also in america there we don't have the sacred spaces the sacred pilgrimages we don't have you know it's (laughs) but at the at the other side of it to to really go into a system like ayurveda and jyotish you have to go fully into it and Mm -hmm. like i'm sure you know how to speak the language now and you know how to read it um, but there's a whole cultural component that you have to understand before you can even mm-hmm. practice to get into it. Whereas, you know, most Americans don't speak more than one language <laughs> if they're white. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, you know, we're raised in this culture, but it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's a little sad. <laughs> it's, it's sad. And there, there is that whole concept of seven generations and we've like crossed that seven generation um level of of invading the americas Mm -hmm. and uh, there is changes being that that are coming there's integration there's indigenous voices that are becoming louder Uh, the uh openness and and 
th there are still people who are brainwashed by the pharmaceutical companies to <laughs> think that that's the only way to, to get better. Some people. I... <laughs> and, and, you know, most people are open for more yet. Right. Uh, the pharmaceutical companies are controlling the college educations. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the, the doctors and nurses are being indoctrin indoctrinated by pharmaceutical companies and they come out not knowing when should I recommend somebody to acupuncture? When should I use Ayurveda? Right. When, when and homothy, it's a joke, they say, you know, and, and yeah. it doesn't matter how many scientific studies show these things are accurate in the yeah. school. They show the one study that proved that it didn't work, that quote, quote, proved that it didn't work. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, so our doctors and our nurses are, which, which are our, our main knowledge providers of health, have been that the pharmaceutical companies have said if we brainwash these guys the rest of all of them will will only have our what we want them to have and yeah. so all the other alternative healing methodologies people have to go and discover on their own yeah, yeah. and the problem with that is people's way to discover that on their own is google right and then google is also and Google is owned by a corporation that is right. that is pushing what a person, what's going to sell and make certain people money. Right. And so people have a really uphill climb to have a holistic um, health perspective. Yeah. Uh, anybody that has one, it's almost like you've succeeded. Yeah. You have beat the system to actually learn enough. And one of the best ways to do that is to step out of the system and to learn acupuncture or Ayurveda or study at a good traditional um, uh, herbalist school and, and really just see with your own eyes the impact of this. Mm, yeah. one, one of my experiences when I was in Ayurveda school that uh, essential oils, I was like, like who, who thinks essential oils can do uh, you know, and, and when I was in Ayurveda school, um, we did, we, we learned how to read pulses and, and I got to see where I could like feel these bumps and I could be like, are you feeling like this? And the person says, yes. And I was like, wow. And like, I could feel these things going on in a human by their pulse. And then we were, we, we learned about essential oils and we were able to put the essential oil under the person's nose and and see, did it change the pulse? Nope, that one didn't. Nope, that one didn't. And then all of a sudden the next oil, like their pulse goes normal. Whatever disorder, it's gone out of the pulse. And it was like, oh my gosh, like it, it, I felt it. I felt the shift in the impact of that oil. So uh, having that direct experience with an essential oil, how can I ever think less than mm -hmm. of somebody who's doing an essential oil therapy? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You need that direct experience sometimes to believe it. And, and so stepping out of the system and studying in an alternative approach and actually seeing it work, I think is so key. One of the biggest things we lack is when should a person go to an herbalist? When uh -huh. should they go to the acupuncturist? When should they go to the chiropractor? When do they need the Vedic astrologer? And we don't, th there is not that directory. It's a major, major missing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, in our culture. Right. Well, that's one of the things we're trying to move towards with what we're doing with this is connect all these disparate traditions. And there's, there's so many that you don't even know about still so, so many, right. But mm -hmm. I, it seems like the astrologer has kind of that role in a certain, like to me, like that seems to be what you're doing. You know, all these people, you know, what the person needs by looking at their birth chart, and then you can direct them to the right specialist i know what they need based on their birth chart and also i'm i'm a constant studier yeah uh my my best friend uh is is an ayurvedic doctor he's fully trained in the tradition of jyotish that i am ayurvedic doctor chinese medical doctor tibetan medical doctor um he he knows seven languages and he's still wow. right now in south india studying with a particular doctor who uses pressure points uh, traditional Indian pressure points to, to treat people. And the guy treats 120 people a day. Wow. wow. He has a crew. He goes in, <laughs> says, use this, this, and this, and this, and, and goes off. Like, and, and that's what, and so, you know, I'm, I'm in this realm where just like, 
imbibing constantly knowledge. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I'm using the chart to, to, to see what's going on. And, and I know the different knowledge systems to point people in the direction of, but it's, it's not every astrologer is that their thing. So, yeah. And if it is someone's thing to, to, to be gathering knowledge systems and helping to direct somebody, there's nothing better than astrology to support that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So while we do have a little bit more time and going yeah. off of this, uh, this train of thought, what is interesting to me that I would like to know more about is um, how you can tell, like, or can you tell, like, what spiritual path to be going on and working towards uh, yeah. with astrology, because that seems to be very crucial too. And all these things are connected, you know? Yeah. And, and so in that we, we have to first start developing what is spiritual path. Yeah. And, and what Americans consider spiritual path versus what an Indian might consider a spiritual path aren't always the same. Right. And, yeah. Uh, our, our most root rule for, for spirituality, and I say that in quotations, mm -hmm. is a combination that shows how do we get moksha? Moksha meaning right. how do we remove the individual self so that we merge into the divine and there's nothing else? Like not mm -hmm. practice, not what rituals do we do in our daily life? The, the what rituals do we do in our daily life? That's actually a different combination. That's actually... A, that, that's it doesn't fall into the moksha category it's it's yeah. a dharma category because yeah. our daily ritual is uh we we would call it spiritual but there's a certain requirement of the human to be staying in line with the universe mm -hmm. that even if you're not getting moksha in this life what kind of practices can you do that will ensure that you're staying in touch with the seasons, in touch with your inner being, in touch with the people around you, and, and, and making sure that society is growing in a healthy way? And so that's that's dharma. So dharma devata versus moksha devata. Mm -hmm. and, and then we have various other breakdowns with, within that. We have, we have the knowledge devata. What are what is the deities that are going to work with you to ensure that you're getting the knowledge that you're supposed to have, so that you're growing and 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 meeting the teachers that you need to be meeting, not for getting liberation, but if you're an herbalist, what are the the deities to work with for you as an individual to ensure that the healing power that you have it reaches its full expression. And it's not just the, the healing God, Dunvantri, or the medicine Buddha. There's, there's a million other deities out there who will make it so that you're treating women in a better way, or that you're treating kidney disease in a better way, or that you're treating skin disorders in a better way. And, and so, so when we say spiritual, uh, most people would consider all of that spiritual. Right. And, and, and would it fall into total spiritual from the Vedic perspective? It wouldn't. Just, yeah. just to differentiate that. Um, anytime you say a deity or a god, people think spiritual. But when we enter this more Vedic culture, there's nothing that spirit and deities are not in and working with that we don't need to work with those deities, whether to have a, a better, uh, to make more money in life. Mm -hmm. There's certain gods that you might want to work with so that it ensures that you have enough clients and that you're making enough money. Mm -hmm. Now, is that spiritual? You're, you're doing prayers, you're doing rituals, you're doing donations, or uh, you, you go on a pilgrimage, but you're doing it to make your career more successful. Right. So, so like someone would call that spiritual, but we, we, it's still in the world. Yeah. Uh, it, it seems like, it, the, like in, in the United States, we have the materialistic mindset. So any work with the spiritual world, world is spiritual. Yeah. 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 And so just, just differentiating that first. Um, when we go to that final moksha level, that liberating the spirit, we, and, and uh, I'll say it, I don't know if it'll make any sense, but we take the highest degree planet, we divide every sign into nine parts, we recreate a new chart based upon the rising sign of that ninth divisional chart, and then we take the highest degree in that, 
find the sign that's 12th from it. See the planets in, associated with that. And those deities and the path associated with those deities is the spiritual path that is most liberating to a person. And it's, it's a wonderful thing to see when you actually can, can do it correctly. We can see that, um, just as an example, I had, uh, it was two Jewish clients the other day. And um, uh, one, and, and the, the real, like to be a, a the, the full Jewish realm is a very Saturnian indication. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and the one partner in that place, it, the, the sign, the 12th from the highest degree planet in that division was ruled by Saturn. Mm -hmm. And Saturn was somewhere else all alone. And so it showed she was a, you know, standard Jew, standard, like, um, one God, he'll punish you if you don't do the way, let's do the tradition, don't question. The, her, her partner had a combination where the 12th from that was also ruled by Saturn. But Saturn came back and went second from that. So meaning Saturn was conjunct the highest degree planet, which was Venus. And Saturn-Venus conjunction is, uh, I joke and I call it the Wicca combination. Wow. Because whenever somebody has it, I said, you're into Wicca and this and that. And occasionally like Wicca's the, the term Wicca now that magic is becoming more developed is people don't always like it. But 15 years ago, you said Wicca and the person was like, you can see that. Well, because <laughs> In, in the Vedic tradition, that's the combination for tree worshiper. Oh. And so when the person has the tree worshiper combination, I'd say, oh, you're into Wicca because, you know, nature magic, right? Yeah. And, and so this person, it was Saturn, but it was conjunct Venus giving it this, this tr tree worshiper, this, you know, nature magic combination showing up. And, and I said, and, and they're but they're both Jewish, but like you can see very different approaches and views. And 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 uh, just talking about that made it, uh, I'm like, this is your approach, this is her approach, and uh, you know, she's not changing at all. Like, we let's let's accept that that's 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 what works for her, and that will never work for you. Yeah, L letting go of those the the the, the nature spirits. Are, are literally your highest path. Hmm. And, and, and so that, that nature spirit, someone else that might show up in their, their Dharma condition, hmm. where it's their Dharma to work with nature spirits, not their spirituality to work with nature spirits. <laughs> right, right. So, so just a little differential, or it might show up in, as their knowledge deity. Yeah. You know, the nature spirits are what give them knowledge and understanding. And by working with nature spirits, they're able to receive teachings. If that Saturn Venus was showing up in, in the, um, that condition, then there's um, uh, medicine Buddha, um, medicine Buddha in, in the Hind in Buddhism, he's medicine Buddha in um, uh, Hinduism. He is uh, Dunvantri, this, this God of medicine and very similar to Asclepius in the Greek tradition. And that's a Mercury moon conjunction energy. Mm -hmm. And so somebody that has Mercury with moon or moon in a mercurial sign or some association of this, they're the, that the, the healer deity is their guiding deity and will show the path. So for some person, practicing medicine is literally their spiritual path. For someone else, it might be their dharmic path. And, and, and so in this way, um, and someone else, it might be in their um, Amatya Devata, um, their Palana Devata. It might be the deity, the deity realm that's supporting their prosperity and wellness mm -hmm. in right. life. It, it's, it's still a deity energy. It's still a path and a deity and a, and a living, because all knowledge is, is, is a path, is a living um, realm of, of knowledge. And, and how it shows up in this way is, uh, does, is that. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah. And so do, do you find that people are already doing that or that uh, clarifying that for and clarifying that for themselves helps them to clarify their spiritual path? Um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a case by case basis. Right. Okay. Uh, we, um, sometimes people like literally I start talking about deities and they're all already there in the person's life. Yeah. 
Other times the person was always interested in that, but they didn't go there. Okay. Right. Other times there's conflict and me saying, this is the direction being indicated. It's like, okay, like that, I always knew it, but this so-and-so said this, so-and-so said that. Mm -hmm. And I was trapped in, in this philosophy of believing that it needed to be a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what a gift to just know, to see, to, to, to have that clarity. Yeah. And, and you can see that, that there's certain people that it's just everything I say, they're just like, yes, that's what I'm yeah. doing. Yes. That's what, and, and like to see a life that has such already inherent alignment is just, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Mm, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Probably rare though. Uh, not, to, but it depends. I mean, I have a lot of clients that yeah. come to me from uh, Buddhist meditation traditions uh -huh. and you, you know, they've been meditating for years and they're a little more, th th that, that meditation really kind of helps lead people in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And then again, sometimes you get people that they kind of got brought into a tradition yeah. And they took on that tradition and they're, they're like, no, this is my tradition. And it's like, that tradition might not be what's <laughs> working for you. I, I, I'm, at least let's, let's try and find a, um, a dark form of the mother in that tradition. <laughs> so like, cool. like, I know you don't have a Kali or a Hecate there, but um, let's, let's try and, uh, uh, so, you know, and it's like trying to find something that meets the frequency in the right way without them leaving their tradition sometimes it takes a little work uh, but as long as we can get the the, the tone then mm -hmm. then we're stepping in the right direction cool because mm -hmm. every deity shows up in every every culture in in right. the culture's clothing yeah. yeah yeah so that's another thing about like <laughs> what are deities and what are like and the same with like planetary archetypes, like, is it something beyond behind the planet and the deity or like what, yeah, what are, are there like levels like celestial and divine? Like, what are we actually mm. working with? Yeah. Um, uh, let's see. It's, it's a big question. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's one that I've given multi-day lectures on so right yeah <laughs> we're, we're gonna say that simply um there's there's I, i've seen some medieval things where they put planets and then angels and then you know yeah. they, they uh and we we have to be slightly multi-dimensional when we answer right. this question because it's it's if we get linear we'll go wrong mm -hmm. yeah so when we look on one level it, as I said, multidimensional. When we look on one level, the planets are, are a gross level of deity. And yeah. there's there's higher forms of devatas, deities above it, frequencies um, that, you know, like maybe an angel frequency is a higher frequency of that planet. And mm -hmm. Shiva is a higher frequency of the sun. And Vishnu is a higher frequency of the planet Mercury. And those planetary archetypes, any deity that ever existed, I can correlate into those planetary archetypes. So mm -hmm. on another level, they are supreme in the archetypal realm. It can be completely divided into these nine planetary archetypes. Mm -hmm. From a Vedic, we're using Rahu and Ketu as, as archetypes. Um, yeah. And we're not using Uranus, Pluto, and Neptune. So, um, and you can find ways to insert them, but uh, but using those nine, everything can fall. Anything you tell me, any deity you tell me, I can throw in and say, oh, medicine Buddha, Mercury, Moon. Oh, uh, goddess Kali, Moon, Saturn. Oh, uh, this deity, Venus. Like it's so I can I can use them as the overarching tone that everything is in those tones and there's frequencies of those tones that get higher and lower so i might not always want to go directly with a planet sometimes it's better to go with a deity that's of that tone but in the end it's all of that tone mm -hmm. so we got to be slightly multi-dimensional there with that i think that's uh, a that. brilliant and, and yeah. concise way of saying that yeah um so if we do have a little bit more time, I would like to also talking about moksha, 
I've been looking at like different yeah. spiritual teachers as uh, birth charts and trying to make some correlations. And in the West, you know, I can't find anybody's actual birth time, <laughs> except for people that I know. But in India, like I've got Krishnamurti, Samana Maharshi's, Nisargadatta, they're all, they have the exact time. Is that, are those actually the exact times? And most of them, most of them. In India, your, your yeah. birth chart's really important and it's normally uh, accounted for. And so, it's been debated also in public circle for a long debate to, and, and timing techniques are used to, to move it one or two minutes in different directions. But most Indians, uh, unless they're born in a tribal village, which there's still tribal cultures in India, which, you know, in America, we put tribal people in, in reservations and move them out. In India, there's still in the forest, there's the tribals. And then outside of the forest, that there's all the city folk. And that's been that way for thousands of years. Wow. Just, just to kind of, you know, there's been yeah. an, a, a harmonic Liberation. between the tribals yeah. and, and city. Um, mm. But unless, unless somebody's born in the more tribal area, uh, the they, they have their birth time just because of the prominence of uh, astrology being a normal part of the average Indian's uh, life. So and, and when we and just yeah. adding to that, the uh, there's three times the population in India. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, it's I, I'm stuck on saying three. It's turned to four now. There's oh. four times the population in India than there is in the U.S. So if, if we say, oh, how many people are into astrology? There's, there's all of a sudden, um, you know, the, the majority of that culture believes in astrology and utilizes it on a day to day. And, and there are four times the, the population is us. There's way more people utilizing astrology on the planet than there are not utilizing astrology. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's just, just true. And, yeah. and people people are stuck in their little um, American TV world yeah. where th it isn't there. Um, but it's 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 as far as the planet goes, it's an accepted utilization that's done throughout this planet. Uh, yeah. And uh, where we were going. The... So moksha. So can moksha. you tell? Could, you, could yeah. you tell from Ramana Maharshi's chart that he would? become enlightened and could you tell when uh, though the when is is uh a little easier than if okay because yeah. we, we get multiple combinations that can give moksha mm -hmm. and there's combinations that show somebody spiritual there's there's different and there's different types of spiritual there's people that yeah. become very ritualistic spiritual yeah. spiritual there's people that become very atma vidya meaning knowing of their inner nature there's people that have deep relationships with deities and, and connection with deities. So we have different realms of, of, of spiritual potentials and within that different types of moksha, um, different types, different traditions are leading in different directions. Uh, whether somebody is, is at one with the deity or are they at one with their true nature or have they blown out into where there's, they're into the, the great void. So, so we have these different levels of what we consider that final goal. And um, we have different combinations that show um, those potentials. Okay. Uh, when the spiritual time periods come, there's a lot of timing techniques in, in Vedic astrology that are utilized for that. And they layer on top of each other. Um, when you get initiated, when you have a spiritual experience, there's certain timing techniques that are literally only for that. Mm. There's wow. this one, there's one called Drig Dasha. And Drig Dasha is literally just for when you have spiritual moments. And uh, there's one book that's written that spends uh, it spends a lot of time going into Padre Pio's life. The Vedic astrologers spent a lot of time really breaking apart Padre Pio's whole existence, use, showing how the Drig Dasha showed all of his um, intense spiritual experiences. Um, uh, and then if we look on on even even our standard what's called Vimshotri, uh, we look at Ramana Maharshi and. He had his his awakening experience. He he went off to Arunachala, the the sacred mountain, and he sat in silence for ten years. 
Right. <laughs> that 10 year period that he sat, he was born during an eclipse. Oh. And he entered the moon time period and, and moon time period is 10 years long. Oh. And so he went and sat in his eclipsed moon time period in silence, meditating on the supreme nature of his self for 10 years without speaking. At the very end of that, he entered sun and he had a disciple come and ask him a question. And he just started talking after 10 years. Wow. So, and you can see that timing just straight there from, from without even the spiritual elements and timing of the chart. So, so there's particular timing techniques. Um, there's a few books written on it. Um, I, it's not one of my big focuses being that I'm much more into um, the physical health, mental health and, and relationship elements. That's, yeah. that's really my big research realm and dig yeah. in. Um, and occasionally when uh, I get, cause I, I go into the realm, I work with a lot of schizophrenic clients. Oh, wow. um, and when we have schizophrenia or psychosis, is it a spiritual emergency or is it, are, are we dealing with a, a loss of reality? And, uh, right. and so I work with a handful of clients like that. And at that point, there's the, we call it Lakshana, Lakshana. There's the indications that they're experiencing. And then we also look at timing. Like, was this a timing for a spiritual experience or was this a timing for a problem in the chart that got exacerbated? And it's it's a nice differentiation there for for figuring out, hey, this person needs to go to an ashram and meditate, or hey, this person needs to be medicated on high level sedatives on for the next year and a half until this transit's done, and then we can start sending them the therapy, and mm -hmm. they'll they'll be okay. Wow. So so. So, so that's the realm that I dig into that a bit and, yeah. you know, the general with, with spirituality, but it's, it's a particular realm to, to work with those charts. But my, my teacher himself, he, he spends so much time with that and say, saying, look, they had this deity experience on this day. And cause you know, they have bios as well, and you can take their timing and everything of that nature. One of the interesting things is we have, um, uh, there's the avatar Krishna uh -huh. and we have his birth data <laughs> and, and the story of his birth data is really, really quite interesting. Um, uh, the, in the scriptures, they list where his planetary placements are. Wow. And uh, he was considered to be born just before Kali Yuga started. Okay. Right. And there's the calculation of when Kali Yuga started, which the um, Muslim astrologers call the year of the flood. Okay. And so the calculation for the year of the flood and the beginning of Kali Yuga are the same between the Vedic astrologers and the Muslim astrologers. Okay. And so Krishna was supposed to be born just before them. And so in his, in, in the scriptures, they have his birth chart. And I always kind of, I took it as like, ah, yeah, 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 you know, like a like, mythic thing, yeah. nice mythology there, right? Yeah. And uh, there was this software back in the early 2000s that was made where you could just put the planets in and it would tell you when that chart was possible. Uh -huh. And when this guy who had made this software, he came to my guru, I was sitting in the room and w while this happened and he said, I made the software. And so my guru just said, and he, he, he read off the chart of Krishna. Mm -hmm. And the dates were maybe like 6,000 years in the future. And the last time that chart happened was 3,200 something BC. <laughs> exactly when they, you know, this Kali Yuga change was. And, wow. and so my guru played with it a little bit, rectified it. And literally, just like you do these modern spiritual figures, he sits there and, and does the different life experiences from this chart. It's, wow. it's, I'm, I'm like... It it, it it changes the realm of what your belief what's what's possible belief wise um wow but uh but yeah so so there's there's so many different realms of uh, in in this spiritual level of of alternate realities and um spiritual realities and and liberation um and then just our day-to-day -day 
what deities we should have to make sure that our life is, is working in a good way, to make sure that your marriage is, is healthy and happy, and to, to, to make sure that we have healthy children mm. that yeah. aren't getting, you know, trapped in a drug realm, but are, are like following a path where they're educating in a good way and, and, and leading a good life. Uh, yeah, there, there's so many elements of that that we can see in the Vedic chart. Hmm. yeah that's that's really amazing yeah um and makes me want to study it a little bit <laughs> just a little bit yeah right <laughs> i mean yeah this seems like a like a, a lot of fun too mm-hmm. yeah um going back to our herbal realm since right. most of the people are into the to, to the herbal uh, realm mm-hmm. when we go to that that text i mentioned in the beginning charka yeah he doesn't mention too much astrology he just kind of mentions, oh, this is karmic disease, and, right. and these are the things that you treat karmic disease. And every so many chapters, he's like, uh, if if the person is eating everything right, living the right lifestyle, this and everything, everything's right, then it's most likely karmaja coming from the karma, you know, and, and saying we, we treat it that way. Uh, but there's also a few here and there we see mention where he says, oh, the best time to take an herbal bath. Mm-hmm. And he mentions certain planetary combinations. Um, and, and so the asterism, we call it Pushya. It's the, um, uh, it's the uh, lunar mansion in the middle of um, second to last lunar mansion in Cancer. Okay. That lunar mansion is considered the best for herbal baths. To, to put the herbs in the bath and to soak and spend the spend the hours just soaking to let the herbs in. Like how cool, like it just throws yes. that in there. Um, so when cool. a woman is getting ready to um, give birth, it talks about different asterisms to make certain things to be ready for her birth to come into being. So we also have the... Um, uh, working with the right stars for when should we make the medicine. And not just from a magical where we're trying to instill a certain deity or energy into the medicine, but what's the time period where it's like th- that that lunar mansion that, that's in the middle of cancer, it's considered one of the most nourishing okay. right. of mm-hmm. the moon. And so what time do you want to give yourself this beautiful bath with candles and, and herbs and scents? And you want the most nourishing time of the month, right? Mm-hmm. And, and because we all don't have time to hang out. And, and, and I mean, herbal baths can make your bathtub really messy. Uh, it's a, it's <laughs> yeah. a lot of work. And, right. and, and so like what if, if we're going to make memory medicines, mm-hmm. When, what are the best times and, and stars for this? And so mm-hmm. this is a whole nother level that Vedic astrology also brings in for, for herbal medicine, um, uh, planting the medicines, mm-hmm. harvesting the medicines, and, and making the medicines. And really right. uh, not needing perfect skies because yeah. we're not bringing it down, but we're just making sure that these medicines are coming into being when the universe says, I'm bringing nourishing energy. Yeah. I'm bringing mental energy. Right. And and really making sure that our medicines are aligning with what the universe is bringing into being. It it adds a it adds a a, a very delicious flavor to, mm-hmm. to this. But not magical. <laughs> well, the, this is the thing. We wouldn't call it magic. Okay. Um and and we wouldn't call it magic in that um, we're not, uh, how, how, how to make the, the, the line here. Um, we're, we're making it with the support of the universe. Right. We're not demanding the universe that I want this to have a certain frequency and you will make this do that. Hmm. So I guess a correlation would be yeah. in, in like the Appalachians, um, you know, we would plant when the moon is in a specific sign, like usually yeah. water signs or Taurus, you know? So is that like a, basically if they don't, they wouldn't consider that magic that, you know, but yeah. it's the universe is supporting the growth. We're, 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 we're aligning. Yeah. We're making sure that our actions are aligning with the, because when we're using that timing, 
the the moon and the stars are showing us what's the intentions that are alive at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what are the desires that are arising in you? Mm -hmm. And we talked about all the karmas are there in the chart, right? Yeah. So why is it that you love herbal medicine and someone else loves music and all they do is focus on instruments and someone else, all they focus on is painting. Mm -hmm. And then we get the people that mix it all together. But we have, you know, <laughs> there's, why is it that someone's not good at math and doesn't like science and someone else loves it? Mm -hmm. So these are in the natal chart. Now, these are, these as, as combinations, they as karmas, they come up inside of us as desires that are bubbling into our mind that take us in certain directions. Mm -hmm. And so when we're aligning with the, the, the phases of the moon and the placements that it's of, of the stars that the moon is in, we're making sure that not just the desires that are arising in us, but that desireness that it lives in all living things is, is going in the direction that we want to be working with. Yeah. Yeah. Like you don't want to plant, uh, plant your garden in November. <laughs> you, you don't want to plant it in November. And we also want to plant it. If, if, you know, like the, the, the most common um, biodynamic you, you, when the universe is in a fruiting feeling yeah. first, if the universe is in a rooting feeling, like those are different tones and we yeah. want to be in, we want to be playing in that tone mm -hmm. and, and we wouldn't call that magic. Right. Okay. It's because we're calling that a certain aligning with nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When what I would call magic, at least, and that's my definition is I'm a, a planet is in a certain placement and I'm saying that energy you go in here and you stay in here. And, and I'm putting you in here because I want this result. And I do whatever mantras with, with certain intentions, with, with materia, mm -hmm. that it's, it's giving me that result because that's the intention I'm choosing for it to hold. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So would you call most remediations magic? Yes. Yeah. The majority of uh, Daiva Prashraya the, the karmic medicine is what in the West would be called magic. Yeah. But again, then again, we don't call donation magic. <laughs> okay. And yet it is. Yeah. Yeah. And particularly if you give that donation and you say, Hey, I'm going to donate to a women's shelter so that my uterus and, and ovaries are healthy. And I start this donation now that's magic. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That that falls under magic because we are altering the, the karmic realm. Right. Talking about magic in that way and karmic realm, I, I think a nice little a, a nice little story to end with, unless you have something more you want to go into. Oh no, please. I love good, stories. Good, right, a nice story <laughs> to a nice story to end though. Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. Yes. So um so one of the things about India is the last, th th there was a, a small time period where they were really historical, but their concept of history is very different than our concept of history. We like to have everything on this date, this happened, on this date, that happened. And, and they're much more, it's, it's a different concept of, of history and how they um, uh, record it. So one of the the, the story, the, the understanding of, of my tradition that uh, I get from my teacher, which we don't have too much written on, so I have to trust. And the story is going to end in something that really gave me this, this deeper trust. But the story, um, uh, he's from Orissa, which is in eastern India. And uh, his family is from a, they're, they're from a Sasan village. It's a particular type of Brahmin. And Brahmin just means priest. And in the Vedic world, they did not differentiate Babylonian priests from Vedic priests. And, and this is a, a really, there, there's multiple like um, academic articles written on this of why didn't they differentiate the Babylonian priests from the Vedic priests? 
And there's different opinions. I don't really agree with any of them, but just to, to put that into, uh, uh, you know. And um, so he's from a Sasan village. What the word Sasan, it's not a Vedic word. Um, the, the family came to Orissa in the 1500s. Uh, they originally were in an area of Madhya Pradesh, the middle of India, that was a big university area. And before that, they were in an area of Gujarat called the, that is associated with the Somanath Temple, which is Shiva as the Lord of the Moon. Mm -hmm. And this is the understanding of the family. And in Orissa, they have the family, that village has a Somanath Temple that they you know, hold is the memory of when we used to be over on that part of the country before we, we came to this side. The, the memory goes, the, there was multiple Muslim invasions of the Gujarat area. They moved to central India that was safer. Eventually the Muslim invasions made it there, burned all the universities, um, and they were invited by the king of Pori to Orissa where they are now. Sasan, um, is an Iranian term that's associated with the Sassanid Empire. Mm -hmm. So yes. whether they're Sassan Brahmins from the Sassanid Empire or not, there's no historical research that's been done on it, just kind of my idea. The main sun temple in Orissa that is associated with the tradition, which is now no longer an active temple after the British kind of came in and everything of that nature, but... Um, <clears throat> That temple, the deity in that temple, was most likely brought from Iran. Wow. It wears boots. They don't wear boots in India. It's mm -hmm. an Iranian style boot. So there was this Iranian culture that came to Orissa and set up this whole sun worship cult that lived in Orissa for a number of years. Um, and yeah, a lot of people don't like an Iranian sun cult that fully lived in, and when I, and I'm saying Iranian, we got to go back, it's Persian, go back, that's Babylonian, right? So get the transition there. Um, and the thing is, the sun worshippers were slow, slowly thrown out of the Sassanid Empire, because the Sassanid Empire was becoming fully Zoroastrian. Huh. And so anybody who wasn't Zoroastrian was, you either converted to Zoroastrianism or, or go live where they want people like you. And so a lot <laughs> of people moved, you know, yeah. and um, the most famous astrologer, Varaha Mahira, his family moved to India at that time because of this, um, you know, they, they were, they were Vedic Iranians. Hmm. And just, just to get that in, when people think about India, like their, their concept of Vedic in India, he was a Vedic Iranian. Right. Okay, just, just holding that space. Um, so my teacher being in, in this, this astrology tradition in Orissa, saying that he came on this condition, to me, I associate that in there. Modern India wants nothing to do with Iran. Wants nothing to do with Pakistan, even though Pakistan was a completely Buddhist and Shaiva country um, before Islam. So there, there, you know, we we think of Pakistan as this Muslim country. It wasn't before. It yeah. was completely Hindu previous to the invasions. So giving giving some grounding to this history. So so my teacher he teaches this this astrology that came from his father his his uncle, his uncle from his father, and, and it goes back generations and, and the, tr the, the transmission of, of the um, uh, line. He, before my guru's uncle died, he gave my guru a, a, a silver, um, and actually I got a replica of it. Oh, cool. I'll pull it out. All right, let's see. So he gave him a, a plate that looks like this mm. and told him a certain puja to do on it, a certain ritual that's done worshiping the sun. Uh -huh. And my guru just, okay, this is what uncle gave, da 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 da, you know, no, no kind of um, nothing more than, okay, this is what I'm doing. And for me, I'm such a researcher and I dug into to what is this? Where's this come from? What's the, 
And it goes back in this um, more sun worshiping culture that was Iran into Northern India that eventually came into Arissa where he's from. Uh, this was a symbol that was used to worship the sun that was in temples that were sun god temples only. No Shiva, no Vishnu, just pure, they, they call it Sauryas, um, mm -hmm. sun worshipers. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I started studying how they worshiped it and, and what were the rituals that were, that were associated with it, I started all of a sudden being like, oh my gosh, that's why he's always, because he's, my, my teacher's always talking about the directions uh -huh. and the gods of the directions, uh -huh. the God of the North, the God of the East, the God of the South, mm -hmm. and how important it is with astrology. And when we're, we're looking at, at the first house, we, you know, the, the God of the East is like, and, and, and he just talks about the God of the East and the qualities of the God of the East, which is Indra in the Vedic tradition. And so, and how that impacts what the first house is and its energy. And, and I'm just like, oh my gosh, he's completely talking about, like it's so ingrained and in, enmeshed mm -hmm. in the astrology. He, he doesn't even know these rituals that are associated with this ancient sun cult that, wow. that was, was associated with it. And I was like, okay. And, and so that to me was, because you can make up a lot of stuff you can't make up, <laughs> you know? And, and so it really gave me this, this deep, this deep faith in, in the tradition and its roots. Yeah. Um, yeah. Amazing. Yeah. yeah, that, that is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, th yeah, this has been, this has been amazing. Uh, Freedom, thank you so much for being on on the show. It's, it's been an really, honor. Yeah, it's been an honor. It's been really cool learning from you, talking to you. And I'm so grateful for your work and everything that you're bringing into this world. So thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, small note, mm -hmm. um, after I got two years waiting, after my waiting list got to two years, yeah. I'm not accepting new clients. Right. If anybody's listening. I'm sorry. At this moment, my students are doing, seeing everything and I'm helping making sure they're being successful. Yeah. And that said, um, my website is scienceoflight.net and that's where I offer classes. And if anybody wants to study, I'm available for teaching uh, as I, I see clients uh, five plus a day daily, but literally my waiting list is, yeah. it's, I'm still, you know, it's, it's, I'm unavailable for new clients, mm -hmm. yeah. but you're making new practitioners. So yes, exactly. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just, I guess a little bit, do you do it yearly, your classes? Yearly, they start, the actual class starts uh, February, March time period each okay. year, depending on, you know, I use a lunar calendar. So in this February, March time period, uh, we start and it goes for, it goes till November officially. And um, there's a, a practicum at the end where people actually read a chart in the tradition that I'm from style. And uh, so it's uh, a competency based course. That's not a, not a completion based course. That's, cool. yeah. that's important. I think yeah. yeah, most courses these days are just completion. Yeah. I really appreciate exactly. that. Especially online. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. You also have a book though, too. I, I have a book and the course actually goes chapter by chapter. Okay. And, you know, there's live classes and we test people as we go through. And when I say test, I mean, where, okay. Like if we have 30, 40 people in the class, so-and-so reads the next person's applies the technique on someone else's and the, that person is right there yes that happened or nope that didn't okay. happen cool. and, and, and that person reads someone else's chart and it's like live interactive feedback right then and there Amazing. yeah cool. awesome. well yeah <laughs> I, I, I would like to study with you at some point yes so hopefully you'll still be doing it yes <laughs> Thanks again, Freedom.